this very, very dreadful this I was and am. But why is it you say that I am mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not dulled them, not destroyed them. Above all, was a sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heavens and the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and come as I, as I show you how calmly, how healthily I can tell you the story. I can't say when first the thought entered my mind, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion, there was none. As gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, he had this eye that resembled that of a vulture. It had a, a pale blue eye with a film over it. Anytime it glanced upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, I made up my mind to kill the man. And it's now I assume you think me mad, but mad men know nothing. But you should have seen how calmly, with what caution, with what dissemination I went to. I was no kinder to the man than the days before I killed him. Every night at midnight, I'd undo the latch on the door and open it gradually just enough that my head could reach in. And once it would open enough, I would stick the lantern in there, closed dark, so not a single light shone out. And once the light, once the gap was enough for me to fit my head in there, I would thrust it in. You would laugh to see how cunningly I'd thrust it in with how slowly, slowly I moved as to not wake the man from his sleep. And once my head was in enough that I could see him laying there, I undid the lantern just enough that a thin gray landed upon the vulture eye. This I did for seven nights, but always I found the eye closed, so I could not do the work, for it was not the man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And thus, every morning I would greet the man in a hearty tone and call him by name and ask him how he passed the night. So, you see, he would have had to have been a profound man indeed to think that every night, just at midnight, I lay there and watch him as he sleep. Upon the eighth night, I was more cautiously than, than before. A watch's minute hand moved quicker than I did mine. Never before that night had I felt the power, the sagacity. The man laid there to sleep, not a thought in his mind of the deeds nor the thoughts that I would do. And so on this night, as I thought, I leant out a faint chuckle. And perhaps the man heard me, for he stirred in his, in his bed. And at this point, you'd think I'd back out, but no. For the room was dark as pitch blackness. For the shutters were closed for fear of robbers. So I stayed there as I knew the man could not see as I opened the door slowly and slowly. Just as there was enough for me to reach my head in, I went to unfasten the lantern, but my thumb slipped, and the man moved and waked, who's there? 
but I stayed motionless. Not a muscle moved. I waited there for an hour. Now, a madman would not be as wise as this. He was sitting there waiting, listening, as I did night after night. And when I heard a faint groan, it was a groan that I knew so well. It was not a groan of pain or of fear. It was a groan of mortal terror, a pain that I felt well up inside my bosom night after night as I watched him. I knew the old man. I knew what he felt, and I pitied him. Although I chuckled, I knew that he had been lying awake since that first slight noise. When he turned in his bed for fears, he had been, he had ever since growing, he had been trying to, to, to fancy them causeless, but found all in vain. All in vain for the death in approaching him had stalked him with the black shadow before him and enveloped him in it was a mournful influence of an unperceived shadow that caused him to feel although he could not see or hear it caused him to feel the presence of my head in the room and after i had waited patiently and resolved to open the lantern I opened it cautiously, cautiously, as to not disturb the man's sleep. And as I undid the lantern, a thin ray shot out like the thread of a spider and landed promptly on the vulture eye. It was open, wide open, and I could feel the ferocity, the furiousness upon the build up inside me. I could see it with perfect distinctness, a pale blue a hideous veil over it that made the marrow in my bones turn. But I could see nothing else of the man's face or of the rest of his body, for I had opened almost if by instinct and landed it precisely upon that eye. So now, do you understand? What you misunderstand as madness is merely an over-acuteness of the senses. Now I say, there came to my ears a dull sound, such that a watches makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well too. It was the sound of the man's heart. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I tried how steadily I could keep the lantern fixed on the man's eye. But the sound, it grew quicker and louder and louder every instant. The man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say louder. Dead of night, amid the dreadful silence of the old man's house, so strange a noise as this excited me to an uncontrollable terror. And now, for some minutes longer, I refrained and stood still, but the beating grew louder and louder. I thought the heart might burst, but now a new anxiety seized me. The sound, it could be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and rushed into the room. He shrieked once, but only once. I dragged him to the ground, threw the bed over on top of him, and I let out a ga I let out a gaily smile for the deed was so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. 
before, not long after, the heart stopped. The man was dead. His eye could trouble me no longer. I moved the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was dead. Stone dead. I placed my hand upon his heart, but there was no pulsation. He was stone dead. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when you see with what caution I dissembled the body. First, I took off the head, the arms, and the legs. I pulled up three floorboards and dissembled them each between. I replaced the four boards cautiously, carefully, so that not an eye could tell the difference, not even the vulture eye. There was nothing to be washed out, no stains of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too weary for that. And when I was finished with my labors, it was about four o'clock. Once the bell rang, there came a knock at the door below. I went down and answered in a hearty tone, for I had nothing to fear now. There came three men at the door who introduced themselves as officers of the police. A complaint had been filed. There had been a shriek heard in the night. And they were deputized to come out and investigate. I, I bade the men enter. I told them the shriek they heard was mine in a dream. The old man, they questioned, he was away in the countryside. I bade them look and look well. I smiled and led them up the stairs. I brought them into the room and showed them all his treasures were secured, undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and told them, here, rest, rest from your fatigues. While I myself and my wild audacity of my perfect triumph placed my chair precisely upon the spot beneath which reposed the corpse of my victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat for a while and answered, and I answered cheerily and chatted about familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I faint, and a faint ringing in my ear. But still, they sat and still they chattered. The ringing became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of it, but it continued. It gained a definitiveness. It tell the length, the noise was not within my ear. No doubt I grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and heightened my voice. Yet the sound increased and what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. The sound the watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but nothing could steady the, the increasingness of the sound. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key with violent gestures, but the noise steadily increased. Why would it not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as I excited in fury of observation of the men, but no, the noise increased. Oh God, how could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore, I swung the chair upon which I was sitting and grated it upon the boards. But the noise, it arose and continued increasingly. It grew louder and louder, and still the men chattered pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, they heard. They suspected, they knew. They were, they were mocking me. As I thought this, I think now, but anything was better than the agony. Anything was more tolerable than the derision. I could bear their hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream. I must die, and now again, hark, louder and louder and louder. Villains, I shrieked, dissemble no more. I admit the deed, I lift the planks. Here you see it, the heart is hideous heart. Thank you. <laughs>